Welcome to the webinar. This new webinar series is aimed at covering a range of topics in the EU and globally for those looking to enhance or start their climate and nature-related disclosures. In the next 30 minutes, we will be focusing on the EU Non-Financial Reporting Directive and what its reopening could mean. Presenting the topic is Nontokozo Kumalo, Corporate Engagement Manager at CDSB, based in Berlin, and Michael Zimoni, CDSB Policy and External Affairs Director, who will be joining us from Brussels. My name is Julia Kislitsina. I'm moderating this webinar. Before we begin, I'd like to invite you to participate in a poll that will help us build a better understanding on the current reporting landscape. The question is, does your company currently report climate change and environmental information in the annual report? You should be seeing a menu with an option to select your answer on the screen now. And while the poll is in progress, I'd like to encourage you to ask questions throughout the webinar via the chat. We will try to find time to address all of the questions towards the end of the webinar. I'm handing over to Nonto Kozo, who is going to provide some background on the disclosure lands landscape. Thank you, Julia, and to everyone who's joining us today. I'd like to start by providing a bit of background about the Climate Disclosure Standards Board for the benefit of those not familiar with our work. I'll then introduce key issues on the disclosure landscape before handing over to Michael. We are a consortium of nine environmental and business NGOs set up in 2007 at the World Economic Forum in Davos. We are chaired by the World Economic Forum and our board members can be seen on your screen. We are also kindly supported by a technical working group of over 40 experts and we show some of them here as well. Our mission is to create enabling conditions for the integration of decision useful climate and natural capital information into mainstream reporting. We achieve this by offering a framework for natural capital and climate change information. The CDSB framework has seven guiding principles, which are basically about the how to report environmental information in your mainstream report. It includes principles such as information should be consistent and comparable. It should be verifiable and forward-looking amongst others. The principles were actually adopted from financial accounting standards, which is really in line with our aim as an organization to mainstream environmental information. The framework includes 12 reporting requirements relating to mainstream reporting, including what to report. It covers areas such as governance, risks and opportunities, policies, strategy, and targets. Notably, the framework is referenced in the non-financial reporting guidelines and by at least five stock exchanges globally. Much of our work at, at uh, CDSB is uh, about supporting the implementation of the recommendations of the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. And while we can assume broad familiarity with the TCFD for the benefit of everyone, we thought it might be useful to have a recap. The TCFD was formed by the Financial Stability Board in December 2015 to develop a set of voluntary consistent disclosure recommendations for use by companies in providing information to lenders, investors, and insurance underwriters about their climate-related financial risks. The recommendations of the TCFD published in June 2017 are essentially the gold standard for making universally accepted climate-related financial disclosures. Since their release, we've seen galvanized political will and support, which has really brought climate change disclosure issues into the boardroom and increased awareness on their link to financial impact. The 11 recommendations structured around four elements the governance around climate-related risks and opportunities, strategy, the actual and potential impacts of climate-related risks and opportunities on the organization's businesses, strategy, and financial planning. Then there's the risk management element, which is really about the processes by, used by the organization to identify, assess, and manage climate-related risks. And then there's the matrix and targets, um, which are used to assess and manage relevant climate-related risks and opportunities. 
Some important aspects to note about the recommendation is that firstly, they are interconnected, which is why it's shown here, um, they're represented actually by the concentric circle that's shown here, and they're also voluntary. And it's important to note that governments around the world are starting to conclude that a mandatory approach may be necessary to ensure uptake of the recommendations at the pace and scale needed to safeguard markets from climate-related financial risk. And just looking at France, for example, they already have the requirement in the form of Article 173, where asset owners and investment managers are required to report on climate-related risks or explain why they've not done so. And then in the United Kingdom, uh, in the Green Finance Strategy, we've seen that it stated that uh, there's, there's expectation for all large firms and financial institutions to report in line with the TCFD by 2022. And then in Canada, the Canadian Securities Administration released a staff notice on reporting climate change related risks, having realized that a, recent, a previous staff notice on um, environmental reporting was insufficient. The Canadian Expert Panel on Sustainable Finance, commissioned jointly by the Ministries of Finance and Climate Change, has recommended that the government endorse a phased, comply or explain approach to the adoption of the TCFD framework in Canada. And then moving on to Australia, the Australian Securities and Investments Commission has rewritten its guidance to explicitly have references to, with regards to the risk of climate change, naming it a systemic risk. And the Australian Accounting Standards Board has provided guidance on how to incorporate climate risk into financial reporting. And uh, just to mention other countries as well, New Zealand also has upcoming disclosures. Japan is moving quickly on these issues. And we've seen quite a lot of progress in Latin America, for example, in Chile. And while the focus of today is the EU, when you look at these developments globally, we see that they, the question is actually no longer if mandatory TCFD implementation is coming, but when and who will be the first to do so. And then just um, going back to some of the other properties of uh, the TCFD, um, one aspect is that the disclosures were meant to be made in mainstream reports. And there are two main reasons why this is important. Main, ma many of the G20 countries actually require public companies to disclose material information in mainstream filings and this information may include climate change. The task force also actually intended that the recommendations actually support these broader country uh, requirements. There's also the expectation that disclosure in mainstream reports would ensure that climate-related information is subject to the same controls as, to, as that, is, um, that other financial information is subjected to. Although the recommendations are for all companies, for Focus is on financial and high-risk non-financial sectors and how these might be affected by transition and physical risk. There's also the consideration of opportunities that emerge from climate change. The task force also recommends that companies conduct scenario analysis to explore how different combinations of climate-related risk might affect the company. Under TCFD, companies must describe short, medium, and long-term climate-related risks and opportunities. And this is not defined. They don't define the time horizons that companies should use, but they rather recommend that uh, companies consider what is relevant for them and their assets. And disclosures can also be, can both be both qualitative and quantitative. The expectation is that, for example, with scenario analysis, initially disclosure will be mostly qualitative. It's important to note that the recommendations of the TCFD build on existing frameworks and that they can be used in a complementary manner uh, to the CDSP framework and with other frameworks as well, such as the CDP and SASB. Companies can use their CDP responses to help generate and structure the data and information that they collect. And they can also use uh, SASB standards to um, basically uh, with, uh, generate the content that is actually financially um, material. And then they can use CDSB's framework to integrate the information in the annual report. Ultimately, all of this leads to better TCFD reporting. 
While the TCFD has been recognized as being key in driving climate issues into mainstream reporting, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive represents a significant step in advancing these issues broadly through mandatory disclosure requirements. Since 2018, the Non-Financial Reporting Directive has required that companies include non-financial statements in their annual reports with flexibility to include the information in a separate report under certain circumstances. Some of the main issues are shown here, including what should be reported, uh, which way it should be reported, and who should report. In June 2017, the Commission published guidelines to help companies disclose the information required under the directive. These were followed by guidelines on climate-related reporting, published, which were published um, earlier this year. The guidelines present some key principles to be considered, including the issue of materiality. Both the NFR directive and the TCFD recommendations have materiality as a consideration to be made when deciding whether information should be disclosed. The NFR directive guidelines uh, introduce the concept of double materiality, which is really really about the existence of two perspectives of materiality with regards to climate change. The first perspective relates to potential and actual climate-related impacts on the company's development performance and position, and this is known as financial materiality. The second perspective is about the external impact of, of the company's activities and is referred to as environmental and social materiality. Notably, for the TCFD, financial materiality is what is considered. Uh, this excludes disclosures um, regarding risk management and governance where there is no materiality requirement. We'll touch on this concept a little bit later in the webinar today. In addition to discussions around materiality, there have also been efforts towards incorporating the TCFD recommendations within the NFR directive guidelines, particularly the guidelines on, on climate-related disclosures. This incorporation is one of the actions outlined in the EU Sustainable Finance Action Plan, which was released in March 2018. The action plan includes aims to strengthen sustainability disclosure through various interventions, some of which being legislative. Fostering corporate transparency is seen as the commission by, seen, yeah, by the commission uh, as being key to enabling market, uh, financial market participants to assess long-term value creation and also manage ESG risks. Ultimately, this contributes to a well-functioning financial system. So we can expect several efforts um, towards achieving this. In, of particular interest uh, with regards to the Commission's aim to strengthen disclosure is the fitness check, which was set to be published later this year and meant to assess public corporate reporting's fitness for purpose. The EU Commission recognized the importance of having a level of standardization in place to ensure that the resulting information is suitable for comparative analysis by investors. But where are we with regards to reporting on these issues? Looking at the five-year implementation pathway defined in the TCFD final report, we see that we should be at a point where significant mainstreaming of disclosure has taken place at the third point of this pathway. However, what we're seeing is that a lot of companies are hovering around the second point where they're only just starting to consider climate-related issues within their businesses. Therefore, it is quite clear that there's still some progress to be made. If you look at the TCFD 2019 second status report, this need for progress is also highlighted in the findings. The TCFD reviewed reports of over 1,000 companies and conducted a survey looking at efforts to implement the recommendations and another survey to understand user views on the usefulness of climate-related financial disclosures for decision-making. Some key findings of the report were that while disclosure has increased since 2016, the level of disclosure is still insufficient for investors more clarity is needed on the financial impact of climate-related risks. This was identified through the, um, through the survey that was um, for the users of the information. Disclosure by companies uh, who disclose on scenarios does not cover resilience of strategies. And then the fourth one is that mainstreaming of climate-related issues 
requires multiple functions. They found that while the sustainability areas of businesses are key drivers with regards to mainstreaming information, other functions of the organization are needed. So we can conclude from all of this that partial disclosures are the norm. And while we have a globally agreed framework, uptake at scale needs to be accelerated. The lack of uptake of reporting on these issues and the investor need for reliable non-financial information is quickening the pace of developments in the reporting landscape. The fitness check is expected to pave the way for a reporting, uh, sorry, a re reopening actually of, of the non-financial reporting directive and the clarification of issues, improving the quality of reporting on non-financial information and ultimately the quality of information available to investors. Companies can already start to equip themselves and prepare for potential impacts of the reopening. I'd now like to hand over to Michael to unpack some of these issues. Please remember to use the chat function to send us your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Santa Cosa, and you for, for staying with us at the end of the day. Um, what I wanted to do uh, after this wonderful introduction by, by Santa Cosa is, is to give you a bit of a uh, feel for the discussions that are happening here in Brussels as the uh, non-financial reporting directives reopening is, is, is being discussed. Um, the Commission has been uh, very uh, vocal about the fact that it would be surprised if the directive wasn't reopened, so it is more than likely that, that this will happen. Um, and uh, we uh, we know that the, the current recommendations or requirements of the directive uh, are a good start, but this, it is well understood and, and, and uh, accepted uh, in Brussels and elsewhere that um, the current requirements do not yet achieve uh, the, the the outcomes that are sought by the directive to, to produce uh, this useful information for decision making by investors and other stakeholders. So I wanted to uh, really bring you here to Brussels with me to to give you uh, an overview of the topics that are discussed uh, here as the as the directive will be reopened. First and foremost, of course, the, it wouldn't be a discussion about the reporting if the topic of materiality wasn't discussed. Uh, Nantagozo has uh, described the materiality, the double materiality definition that has been uh, included in the directive it, itself. Um, it had uh, various uh, forms of implementation, and uh, in particular, there has been a specific issue in, in Germany where the, this transposition was understood uh, to require companies uh, a very high level of materiality determination where the information to be reported had to be both financially and environmentally and socially material. So both, it had to uh, satisfy both criteria, which resulted in a lot of information being excluded from annual reports, uh, although I have to say that uh, much of this information has been reported elsewhere in um, it said the reports and CDP disclosures, et cetera, et cetera. So it is a, it is a question of the location of the information. But of course, determining what to include, what is most material, is 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 information by itself. What is not included is also uh, as important as as what is not in, what is included in the report. On that same theme, um, there are also discussions around uh, immaterial disclosures, the other side of the uh, the spectrum. Uh, it is important, of course, in, in a long annual report to ensure that we only include what we absolutely have to and we, and we include it uh, in a concise uh, manner so that it can be yeah, easily read by the user of this information, of this report, and perhaps other uh, information that supports this information could be uh, reported elsewhere in a, in a, in a way, manner that is easy to access. There are also some quality considerations uh, under discussion. Um, First and foremost uh, is the reliability of the information and the role that assurance can play in this uh, in this matter. The current uh, preamble of the Non-Financial Reporting Directive says that statutory auditors and other firms should only check that the non-financial uh, statement or the separate report has been provided. Uh, this means that uh, uh, it, there is no requirement to audit the actual content of a uh, report. So uh, there is a debate on whether this uh, should be strengthened, and if so, how, uh, given the current state of assurance. There is also a debate about the comparability of the information. 
especially in the quantitative metric side of things? Um, can there be more uh, alignment in the metrics use? Can there be perhaps a certain uh, a prescribed set of metrics or KPI uh, to include in the requirements themselves? And there's, of course, a question around factor specificity of, of these uh, KPIs and metrics to make sure that uh, there can be uh, comparability within a certain sector. Other considerations um, debated here are the scope of the companies that should be covered by the directive, the current, uh, the final uh, description or requirement or, or limit to the companies that are uh, captured by this directive, by the requirements, are uh, predominantly uh, defined by the size of the company, the number of employees, that is 500 employees. Although, for example, in Sweden, uh, Sweden has uh, gone for a a lower limit, 250 employees. So uh, there is a debate about this. And if, if some of you were involved in, in um, or following, were following the directive development from the start, you might remember that uh, the original uh, remit of, of the requirements uh, was closer to capturing about 20,000 companies rather than the uh, roughly 6,000 that it ended up uh, uh, covering. Now, of course, if we go to uh, companies that have less staff, there is, of course, a question of capacity to report. Um, so it, that needs to be, of course, taken into consideration to make sure that requirements are proportional to, to what the company can do. But we would argue, of course, it's also important to make sure that this proportionality takes into account the materiality of these uh, issues. And if they are really material, um, they can. That, if if a, if a certain uh, information is material, that is sort of regardless of of the size. So that there is, but this is a it is something that needs to be taken into account. The other uh, element that is discussed, of course, is the location of disclosures. Currently, there is a uh, an exception to be able to report, uh, not not just in the management report or the annual report of a company, but also in a separate report and up to up to six months later. Now, of course, this 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 has uh, reasons behind it, but from a user's perspective, as a as a, as someone reading the annual report, uh, if the information is not there in the same document in a connected way at the same time, it can also be it can often be an issue uh, which can limit the actual use of this information that is reported if it is reported too late for it to be um, to be uh, used. Finally, there is of course a, a discussion around. The various other elements of the sustainable finance action plan uh, there is a lot of discussion around the taxonomy uh, for for green activities requirements for investor disclosure etc cetera, etc cetera, that all form uh, the same uh, part of, of this um, of this discussion and it is of course important to make sure that uh, that everything is aligned and works in the same framework on the location of disclosures just moving back quickly uh, I also wanted to flag up um, a report by Accountancy Europe uh, called Core and More, where they have uh, talked about uh, reporting the most material information in the annual report of a company and providing some other information in separate reports, more information in other reports, uh, linking them, of course, and making sure that this is uh, done in a, in a way that is most suitable for the reader. And of course, keeps the, the main document, the core report, uh, concise and easy to read. Other uh, considerations uh, debated here are the are stronger in incorporation of the TCSD recommendations. As, as I'm sure you agree, and then from from Nantokoso's presentation, it's clear that the TCSD has become a de facto standard for climate-related financial reporting, uh, and the updates to the non-binding guidelines to the directive have provided a good start. But of course, it is not a complete uh, alignment, and it, it, it would be uh, more uh, useful to have full integration to make sure that we have a single framework to report to uh, that incorporates these developments. Um, there has been um, also by CDSB, who has aligned, we have aligned the CDSB framework uh, almost completely with the TCID recommendations, and other and and uh, us as a report standard setter community have have really. Uh, aligned behind the TCID recommendations. Um, so there is a, 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 a benefit to, uh, from an alignment perspective there as well. And last but not least, uh, there is, of course, a strong financial market focus uh, of the TCID recommendations, which is crucial to achieving the sustainable finance objectives that this uh, agenda 
uh, in Europe is, is, is hoping to achieve. On, on, in addition to purely climate change, there are a lot of discussions around TCFD and applying for its, its, its approach to wider natural capital or biodiversity or environmental information. It is clear that uh, climate change is uh, not the only environmental risk. Um, the recent Intergovernmental Panel on bi bi uh, Biodiversity and Economic System Services uh, report has uh, shown that uh, there are uh, over a million species um, at risk of, of, uh, of extinction and hundreds of billions of dollars at risk uh, in, in the agriculture sector, and we are not on track with our with our targets to uh, both from on biodiversity, both from the SDG perspective and other um, targets perspective. So uh, there is a um, an argument to be made around the the approach taken by the TCFD in applying this that worked so well to also wider natural capital information. And uh, with this, I'd like to actually hand over to, to Julia uh, to, to, to tell you a little bit about what we are trying to do in this space to, to understand our role in supporting this uh, natural capital uh, for TCFD element. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much, Nonto Kozo. Um, yes, on this note, I'd like to point out to your attention that CDSB has launched an open public consultation and call for evidence on advancing nature-related disclosures and use of CDSB framework. We invite you to participate, share your views, and submit your responses. More information can be found at cdsb.net consultation. And since we don't have much time uh, left, let's go straight to the Q&A. We have a question. Uh, what is the key thing companies can do to prepare themselves? Um, I, I guess this is a question to you, Nontokozo. Would you like to take it? Um, yes, sure, Julia. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, I think companies can start by enhancing the overall structure of their reporting. Um, this will make it easier to adapt when changes come. So they could look at aspects like the interconnectedness of the information, for example, links between environmental matters and corporate strategy, just having some clarity really on the holistic nature of the relationships in their reporting. Um, clear and concise reporting would be another aspect. Um, people could also start um, reminding themselves of the principles of disclosure and actually really getting down to the basics. For example, looking at the TCFD principles of effective disclosure. I think that could be a good start. There's another question. Um, since mater materiality is only included in the guidelines, how important are they to complying with the requirements of the directive? Uh, this question is addressed to Mike. Yes, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so this is this is a, a perhaps a question of, of definitions. Um, the, the the this double materiality uh, sort of concept uh, that that is uh, described in more detail in the in the non-binding guidelines is actually uh, based on text taken from the directive itself. So uh, it is there is a de this the definition is, is is in the directive itself. However, it, it is not using the word uh, materiality to describe it. So um, it is it is part and parcel. If it's, it is is included in the the uh, directive's requirements, it's just using a different word, which is um, perhaps there could be more done to to use the same terminology to align with with uh, other materiality definitions, um, especially given the fact that half of this double materiality definition is taken from financial materiality. So uh, on, in, the, um, in the directive itself, it says, to the extent necessary for an understanding of the company's development, performance, and position, and impact of, it, of its activities, uh, public interest entities must disclose such and such and such matters. So this wording is the, defi the definition of materiality although it is not framed as, as such. So it is, it is very much uh, in the, uh, the directive, and of course, it, therefore, it is, it is uh, crucial to disclosures. And do we expect a change with regards to the flexibility allowed to companies in some jurisdictions is another question. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, 
that that is um, that is what we'll find out. Uh, and once the directive will be reopened, there will be a, a significant amount of debate. It's, it's it's simply too early to say, but uh, um, you know we hope to to uh, to be engaged in this. And if you are interested in engaging in this process, please uh, drop us a line, and we'd be happy to uh, look you in and make sure that your voice is heard as well. So um, I, I I don't have a perfect answer for this, just to say that uh, we'll see. Um, that, that's the best I can say. We have for the questions at the moment. Uh, thank you to the speakers. Uh, thank you for join, uh, joining us today. Uh, we hope that this webinar was useful. Um, and looking forward to your feedback. We welcome your suggestions on topics that should be covered in what you need to know webinar series in the future. Uh, feel free to get in touch with us via social media at CSB Global on Twitter. Uh, you can find our company page on LinkedIn, or you can, of course, write to us by email, info at cdsb.net. And uh, just to confirm, yes, we will be distributing the uh, presentation as video among all the participants in, the, in, a, in a couple of days, basically, this week. Thank you once again, and have a good day.